The mind well trained brings happiness. The mind untrained brings suffering and stress. The Buddha once said it's a sign of a wise person to realize how much the mind needs training. It's untrained, it's like an it's like an animal untrained. If you have a dog that hasn't been house trained, it can't live in the house. You have a horse that hasn't been trained, you can't ride it. An elephant that hasn't been trained, you can't get it to do any work. And it's the same with the mind. If it hasn't been trained, it'll make a mess here, a mess there, all over your life. Just as things are going well, you act on some stupid desire, greed, anger, and delusion come in. You make a mess of what you've done. We see this happening all over the world. And yet when it comes time to train our own minds, we resist. Because training means directing it in a direction it otherwise might not want to go. So it becomes a battle of the wills. Part of you wants to go whatever old way you went before, the way an untrained horse would just want to ride around the, the meadow, run around the meadow. And part of you realizes it needs to be trained. So there's always going to be this tension in the practice. And an important part of gaining the upper hand is learning how to identify with the, the desires that want to train the mind. It's not so much reason versus desire as reasonable desires versus unreasonable desires. Because the purpose of this is not simply to be harsh and disciplinarian and come down hard on things. It's to find true happiness. You want a happiness that lasts. You want a happiness that really is satisfying, a happiness that doesn't turn into something else. So this is why we practice. It's not a practice of just accepting everything as it is or going with the flow. A lot of it has to go against the flow. That's what the three trainings are all about. Training in virtue, or training in heightened virtue, training in heightened mind, training in heightened discernment. The precepts, for, exa for example, they're meant to be clear-cut, and they're promises you make to yourself. Because the practice of learning to keep a promise to yourself is very important for the whole rest of the practice. Make up your mind you're not going to kill, steal, have illicit sex, you're not going to lie, you're not going to take intoxicants. Or as a monk, you make up your mind you're going to stick with all the precepts, all the training rules that the Buddha laid down. And suddenly you find a wall here and a wall there, things you used to be able to do with the greatest of ease, all of a sudden you can't do anymore. And so you have to learn skill in holding by that promise. In other words, if you simply feel that you're bottled up by the precepts, there'll come a point when you explode. You have to use wisdom, you have to use discernment in sticking with the precepts. When there's a desire inside that comes up against a precept and wants to say something that the precepts don't allow, well, look in your mind for the desire that wants to stick by the precept and understands why it's important to stick by the precept. This way you learn to train yourself intelligently. 
learned effectively. And the more discernment you bring to the process, the easier it becomes to stick by the precepts, because you keep reminding yourself, oh, this is why I have this precept. There's a really good reason here. And it's this willingness to listen to the training, to take the training seriously. To keep reminding yourself there's a reason for these rules, there's a reason for the way the Buddha set out the training. It may not make sense immediately, or may certainly not appeal to some of your desires. But it's good to learn you can't take your desires as your guide. Maybe the Buddha knew more than you do. And the best way to test that is to follow his teachings and see where, where they lead. Until you get to the point where you feel comfortable with the precepts, and it begins to go against the grain to even think about going against them. That's when you can say that you've begun to train the mind. Because the Buddha is working on one very basic, very elemental and natural desire. We want to be happy. And once we have happiness, we don't want it to change. And we certainly don't want our own actions to destroy it. So it's not like he's asking us to do something unnatural. He's just taking our natural tendencies and training them in the right direction. It's like training a plant. So you've got some ivy and you want to grow up, it to grow up the wall in a particular pattern. Well, you can train it. You bend the little tip here, tie it down there. And you're not asking it to do anything unnatural. You're not asking it to develop leaves that ivies don't, ivy won't grow. You're not asking it to become a tree or anything that ivies can't do. You're just figuring out a way to make it go in the direction you want it to go. And once it's been directed in that way, it'll do its natural thing. It'll keep growing and growing and growing the way ivy grows. Simply, you've got it growing in the direction you want it to go. Same with training the mind. We're not asking it to do anything unnatural. It's just taking your natural desires and aiming them all in the same direction towards true happiness. Same with training in heightened mind, which is basically training in concentration, training in right concentration. You look at the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation. You Mindfully you breathe in, mindfully you breathe out. You know when you're breathing in long, you know when you're breathing out long. You know when you're breathing in short, you know when you're breathing out short. Then you train yourself. All the remaining steps are training. It's got to be an element of will. Be aware of the whole body. This takes effort, because the mind has a tendency to shrink. Focus on one little spot, and this spot here and that spot there. It's kind of like a spotlight that moves around. Like those crazy spotlights you see focusing up on the sky sometime, moving in all directions. Only the mind is crazier. Jumps here, jumps there, one spot to the next. But we get your conscious awareness to settle down and spread to fill the whole body so that you're consciously aware of the, every part of the body as you breathe in all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out-breath. This takes training. But it's not unnatural. Simply you're directing the mind to stay here, and the best way to keep it in the present moment is to fill the whole body in the present moment. So your idea of the hand is in the hand, your idea of the head is in the head, your idea of the feet is in the feet. And then maintain that. And at first it may seem to go against the grain because you haven't been doing that, but as you get more and more used to it, you settle down and find that it really is a good place to stay and a good way to stay. Otherwise the mind is like a cat that's always ready to jump. It lands on one thing that's kind of rickety, so it's already tensed up, ready to jump the next time it has to. So constantly in this mode of tension. 
But if you allow it to melt into the body and have a sense of ease in the body, it doesn't feel the need that it's going to have to jump. It doesn't need to tense up. Much better way of maintaining your awareness. And so on through all the other steps of breath meditation, training yourself to calm the breathing, training yourself to be sensitive to pleasure, sensitive to rapture. That takes training, because sometimes the incipient stages of pleasure and rapture are hard to notice. They're subtle. It's like little tiny sprouts. If you don't pay any attention to them, if you don't appreciate them, you just step on them and they're dead. But if you allow them to grow, they can turn into big plants. The same with a sense of ease and rapture. It doesn't seem like much to begin with, but there is the potential for a rapture in every little nerve ending. Once you locate it, tend to it, allow it to grow, it can take over and have a strong sense of refreshment and fullness all through the body. And then you allow that to calm down. Again, these are all steps in the training. Because you realize you can't just stay with the, there with the pleasure and the rapture. That's not solid enough. You want something more solid than this. So the Buddha lays out the steps. No, there is a natural progression. Again, it's natural in the sense that you're taking a natural desire, your desire for, for happiness. And you're giving it direction. The same with heightened discernment. Seeing where the, the acts of the mind are causing stress and suffering. Learning to see that they're not necessary. Part of this goes against the grain, because it's asking you to step outside of your thoughts and watch them as events patterns of cause and effect in the mind without getting involved in the, in the dramas and the narratives that come from being immersed in those thoughts. It's a new habit, but once you develop it, you begin to realize that that's, it's the best way to function, the best way to deal with your mind, use your mind as a tool. So you can direct it where you want to go. You, you want it to go to true happiness. Well, this is how you do it. It goes against old habits, but it's not asking you to do anything unnatural. Like the ivy. You want it to go up the chimney? Well, if you find any little strands that are going off in the other direction, you bend them up, tie them down a little bit for a while, and then you'll find it just naturally growing up the chimney. You want the mind to grow toward true happiness, so this is how you do it. You've got to bend it here, bend it there. Force it here, force it there. Use wisdom and discernment and intelligence in how you do the forcing. So at least part of you is happy to go. And over time, more and more of you will be happier to go. Because you begin to see the results of the practice, it really does lead to true happiness. So we're not just here to relax into things as they are, or learn total acceptance of things as they are, or go with the flow. We're trying to direct the flow. The image the Buddha gives is of engineers building canals, building dams, directing the water to where you want it to go. It waters your crops instead of just flowing on by and going down to the sea. So many of the images in the Pali Canon are of just that, directing things, fashioning things, shaping things, the irrigators directing the water into their crops, fletchers making arrows. And as the Buddha said, the wise people train themselves. <laughs>